to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Today we look at accomplishments and challenges facing women, both in the past and the present. In Arizona, we learn how flag football is becoming a hot sport, especially among girls. And in New York, we meet descendants of some of the most impactful figures of the women's suffrage movement. But we begin with a look into the alarming rise in breast cancer diagnoses in women under 50. A recent study shows a nearly 8% increase in cases from 2010 to 2019. Christina Ruffini speaks with one woman in her 30s about her diagnosis and how it went undetected for so long. Do you see any birds right now? Stephanie Girard is many things. A grad student, a mother, a new homeowner. What was a bigger shock to the system, the actual chemo or the fact that you were having to have it at 38? I think probably having to have it at 38. Now, she's also a woman with cancer. When you start treatment and you look in the mirror and you're like so sad and so depressed that you're, you're losing your hair. And then on the flip side, you're like, what is hair? Who cares? All I care about is life. I want to live. I want to watch my daughter grow up. Gerard has a family history of breast cancer and a genetic mutation that puts her at higher risk. For more than a year, she says she also had persistent pain in her left armpit and breasts. Doctors ran annual sonograms, even a breast MRI, but found nothing. They always said, you don't need a mammogram until 40. No mammogram, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. They've said it's normal. My doctor said cancer doesn't hurt. In May, she saw a new doctor who ordered a mammogram, which came back positive for low-stage breast cancer. The radiologist told me, no, this doesn't show up on a breast MRI because these are microcalcifications that can only be picked up by a mammogram. So you needed the mammogram. So you needed the mammogram. She also needed a double mastectomy. When I found out that I was going to have a mastectomy, I thought, like, I want to remember my body, like, the way it was. <sighs> um... Sorry. No, no, no. Um, I want to remember my body the way it was. And so I had put out onto Instagram, you know, if anybody knew a photographer. That's gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you. In her head, this is how Stephanie still sees herself. That's my hair. Yeah. Hair and boobs. Yeah. With a mane of dark waist length curls and her pre op curves proudly displayed, she gave us emphatic permission to show the unedited photos, but we blurred them for the sake of morning TV. Have you thought about taking them again when you're done with this whole process? I have. I have. It's still my body. It's just got some battle wounds. Following the procedure and subsequent tissue testing, Gerard's cancer was upgraded to stage two ductal carcinoma an invasive form of the disease that spread to her lymph nodes. She now needs chemo and radiation. You have to make screening earlier. Like, by the time we, what if I had waited till I was 40? Yeah. If there is something in the back of your mind telling you this is not right, then you have to push for it any way that you can get that test. Whatever it takes, she says, to be around, to watch your kids grow up. Every moment I look at my daughter, it's like I'm trying to hold on to like every moment. I just want to know like I'm going to be okay, I'm going to be here, I'm going to watch her grow up. We turn now to our nation's capital where two young legislators are pushing it to make it easier for new mothers to serve in Congress. Scott McFarland speaks with the lawmakers behind the bipartisan bill. In her first term, Florida Republican Anna Paulina Luna is learning the Capitol complex's maze of corridors. So is her newborn son, who's getting quite a good look from his stroller at the marble ceilings. Luna and California Democrat Sarah Jacobs, both of whom were born in 1989, are seeking change in a building which clings to history. I think that this is going to open the discussion. Authoring new legislation requiring the House allow its members who give birth the right to vote by proxy from home for the first six weeks. You said you're only the 12th woman to ever give birth while serving in the U.S. House, and you can't vote when you're home with the baby. Is that because men wrote the rules? 
<laughs> well, I think that when the Constitution was written, I don't know if they anticipated women would be in office. It's very obvious that this institution was designed by and for old white men. Luna suffered complications before and after her delivery and had to shuttle back and forth to Washington for key votes amid a government shutdown crisis. Jacobs put motherhood on hold, worried how she'd make it work between D.C. and her home in San Diego. So I decided to freeze, freeze my eggs, uh, and that required you know, months of hormone pills, of shots, of a, a procedure under anesthesia. Doctors are unequivocal and emphatic. You learn the first six weeks with baby are critical. Babies. You're going through a recovery process. There's some pain involved. But meanwhile, you're in charge of feeding this baby, and this baby depends on you. And building a routine. Building a the hardest part probably is learning to build a new routine. In Congress, change comes slow. So far, fewer than three dozen colleagues have joined the effort, none of them in leadership, after pushback about a proxy voting system that was misused by some during COVID. We're not, you know, trying to go party in Cabo San Lucas here. We're trying to actually take care of, you know, a newborn. Luna has transformed part of her office into a nursery, and the baby is a new fixture in these old halls. Coming up... How one increasingly popular sport will soon be touching down at the Olympic Games. That story is next. Welcome back. Flag football is often seen as a safer alternative to traditional tackle football. So much so that the game is becoming a high school varsity sport in states across the country. And it will become an Olympic sport beginning in 2028. Here's Chris Van Cleve with a sideline report. Hey, go for me, go for three, one, two, three, go! High school senior Nyjah Green is a force on the football field. She grew up playing the sport, but as she got older, there just weren't a lot of options for girls. There's this sense that football is kind of a boys' sport. I would disagree. <laughs> Tell but me why. Girls can do the same thing as boys, literally. Like all the boys be out, they be low-key watching our games. Like. They be watching like, oh shoot, she, she can actually catch. She can actually go up for the ball like I can. She signed up immediately when Arizona became one of eight states to add flag football as a varsity sport last year. 22 other states are now considering similar action and Green is planning to continue her flag football career in college. What's it meant to be able to just keep, to keep playing and now, it, now maybe be able to do it in college too? It's amazing. Like I never, I never expected this. I always had to play with the boys. I was always playing. With, it was never girls. A handful of small universities are adding flag football and offering player scholarships, prompting one of the first female flag football player combines to be held in Houston. With 52 women from across Texas last month hoping to impress college coaches, the NFL is helping the game's expansion with funding and a massive marketing push. NFL Flag has organized more than 1,800 leagues with nearly 700,000 players nationwide. Women make up 25% of the athletes and are the game's fastest growing segment. It's making those establishments or making those advancements for women's sports and finally getting recognized. Last year, nearly half a million girls ages 6 to 17 played flag football, a 63% increase from 2019. There are now more than 15,000 girls playing flag football at more than 700 high schools. It's brought young women into the sport and given them a chance to play, which I think is incredibly valuable. You want to start seeing this thing grow a lot more and really have an opportunity to play big-time Division I football back to quarterback. Lorenzo Alexander is a two-time NFL Pro Bowl linebacker. He played 15 seasons in the NFL. Toes on the line, toes on the line. But he'll tell you he's having more fun coaching his daughter's flag football team. His young sons are playing too. Good, break on it. I didn't let my sons play tackle, but this was a great alternative where they could still learn the game, get out here, work on their athleticism, and really maybe get a leg up on some guys that played primarily tackle football. This is one of NFL Flag's largest regional tournaments. Nearly a thousand kids ages 8 to 17 from eight states. The teams that win here, they go on to the NFL Flag Championship Series. Those are played at the NFL Pro Bowl. Gotta go. Pull the flag. Pull the flag. The pace is quick. Everyone on offense except the quarterback is eligible to catch and run with the ball. And defenders, instead of tackling, are trying to pull the offensive player's flag. A 2021 CDC study found kids between 6 and 14 sustained 15 times more head impacts playing tackle football than flag football.
Kids playing tackle also experienced 23 times more high magnitude head impact events each season. A lot of people like the kind of sort of lighter nature of the sport. And yes, there's running and diving and potential risk of injury there, but it's less severe impacts, um, less collisions, and that's really appealing to a lot of people. People like Nija Green, who hopes flag football keeps her on the gridiron for years to come. Ready, Ready set, go. All right. <laughs>Her hard work is paying off. <laughs> She's fast. She's ranked 14th in the world. What's the best part of bobsledding? Oh, the speed. The speed and the adrenaline. Going 90 plus miles an hour down an ice track and competing wearing Team USA across my chest. Representing America as a competitor, a Marine, and an inspiration to young women and girls. Good job. Riley, what do you want your legacy to be? I want to be remembered for how I make people feel. I don't want to be remembered for all the things that I did and the accomplishments and the medals. I want to be able to create a path big enough that multiple people can run through it and accomplish things that they never thought was possible and kind of create a roadmap to do it. Ahead, how descendants of the suffragists are carrying on their ancestors' legacies. This is Eye on America. We close our show with an appreciation for those who fought tirelessly for women's voting rights. Harriet Tubman, Susan B. Anthony, and Ida B. Wells Barnett were three of the most notable suffragists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Michael George met with some of their descendants who are keeping their memories alive. Right here, we see a picture of Aunt Harriet, and this was found very recently, actually. Michelle Jones Galvin is the descendant of one of the most important women in American history. For most Americans, Harriet Tubman is this larger-than-life figure. Yes. You call her Aunt Harriet. Oh, yeah. We, <laughs> yes, we do. And by the way, what's so interesting about Aunt Harriet is that everybody in her hometown, white, black, it didn't matter, they all called her Aunt Harriet. My connection with Harriet Tubman is that my three times great grandmother, Sophia, was her sister. So that would make you the great, 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 great. grandniece yes, of Harriet Tubman? It certainly does. I'm so surprised that you got that. <laughs> <laughs> we met with Galvin at the Matilda Jocelyn Gage Center near Syracuse, New York, named after the 19th century women's suffrage leader. Well, now we are in the Underground Railroad room. Part of the museum highlights Tubman's contributions. As a conductor for the Underground Railroad, she personally helped more than 70 enslaved people escape to freedom. But she also fought in the Civil War as a spy, becoming the first woman to command armed military missions in America. Now it's our time. You ready to kill the snake? Yes! As depicted in the film, Harriet. Ready? Can you imagine the courage it takes for anybody, let alone a woman of about five feet tall, to actually be in the military and be trusted to lead three 
attacks on Confederate land. I mean, that is just stunning. What most people don't know is that her father was a minister. Galvin wrote a book with her late mother about their family history. She really had a very close relationship with God, and her home life um, was the foundation of it. She says one of Tubman's great achievements was co-founding the National Association of Colored Women in 1896, which fought for equality for the women of color who had been left out of the suffrage movement. There was a mainstream movement, predominantly white women. We know that there were African-American suffragists as well. And Harriet's voice with regard to voting rights for women really spanned both of those contingents. They came together around the right to vote. But earning the right to vote didn't happen overnight. It took suffragists more than 70 years. Beginning with Wyoming in 1890. First, winning victories at the state level. Opponents called them radicals, bent on destroying the family unit. A 1912 New York Times editorial argued if women voted, soon they'd want to be police officers, serve on juries, or become judges. A key figure in the movement was Susan B. Anthony, president of the National Woman Suffrage Association. My great great grandmother, Ann Eliza Anthony, was Susan B. Anthony's aunt. Susan Whiting was named after her ancestor, who was determined to vote even if the law said she didn't have the right. And in 1871, that's exactly what she did. She was famously arrested for voting before it was legal, but she never did go to jail or pay a fine. She was issued a fine, yeah. but she wouldn't she, pay but it. But she wouldn't pay it. She never did pay it. <laughs> Today, Whiting is following in Anthony's footsteps, chairing the board of the National Women's History Museum in Washington, D.C. What we're trying to do is educate about the women who have been significant contributors and inspire young people particularly. Women gained the right to vote in the Western states first. Mm -hmm. Author and public right. historian Michelle Duster is a descendant of one of those contributors. Ida B. Wallace was my great-grandmother. As an investigative journalist, Ida B. Wells exposed the horrors of lynching in America. She worked tirelessly to battle racism and to advocate for suffrage. As a woman, as an, as an African American, she had to fight on every front in order to have full citizenship. What was the reaction to her work? She was threatened. Her life was threatened, and she dealt with a lot of violence. She dealt with a lot of insults. People tried to discredit her. And it was not an easy thing for her to do because she was speaking out against the power structure in this country. Duster is helping preserve Wells' legacy for future generations, writing and editing books about Wells, including a children's book. Duster helped create these murals in Chicago dedicated to suffrage. It feels to me that you're continuing the work that she began. Do you see that connection? <laughs> to Ida B. Wells? I, I don't know if I see it the same way some other people seem to. <laughs> I, I feel that the similarity is that there's truth telling. Dateline, Washington, D.C., August 26th, 1920. In 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was certified as law, the result of a hard-fought effort by figures like Susan B. Anthony, Ida B. Wells, and Harriet Tubman. The ladies appeared at the polls on Election Day by the hundreds of thousands. And the daughters of the suffragists say we can all learn from their sacrifice. I think the lessons that we can learn today is what Aunt Harriet and our founding mothers would say about voting. And that is make sure that you do it. Make sure that you take your voice to the ballot box. My big message is please vote. People worked so hard for so long to get give you that opportunity. Given what's going on in our country right now, there's a great need for people to learn about the past. Everybody needs to have their voice heard. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.